Welcome to Star Guys, a podcast about Stargirl on the CW. I am one of the Star Guys, Alex. I, a Star Guy named Justin, am here. I, I'm Pete. Are you a Star Guy, Pete? Pete, we uh, need to know. We, yeah. Are you a Star Guy? This are you really announcing mysterious. your Star Guy badge? Your Star <laughs> Star? Star Guy Star? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know how to answer that, but uh, I'm a guy and I'm, I, I like stars. Oh, that's great. And we like Stargirl <laughs> cool. on the CW. We're going to be talking about Summer School Chapter 2, the second episode of Season 2. If you haven't seen it, spoilers ho. But to give a broad overview of what went down this episode, we got the return of Cindy Berman. She showed up at her mom's house. Her mom was tempted by Eclipso. Oh. And then by the end of the episode, Eclipso had forced Cindy to fight her own mom. And then Cindy ate her mom. That's uh, she turned her mom into dust. We'll she debate this later. I think this is going to be a fun one to talk about. Yeah. But yeah. meanwhile, we also got a lot more about Jenny Green Lantern's daughter, who showed up at the end of episode one. We get a flashback to her time as an orphan at the Ordway Home for Children in Milwaukee. Shout out to Jerry Ordway, one of the co-creators yes. of Jenny, aka Jade. Alan Scott's daughter. And over the course of the episode, we find out that she is everything that Courtney thought she was, but was not in reality. And then there's a break by the end, as you might expect. Uh, Jenny is learning her powers thanks to Pat Dugan, who's teaching her how to use the energy contracts. But she's holding a lot inside. She's holding a lot of anger, breaks the lantern. They bring it to the center of town. It explodes. Jenny saves everybody and in the process seemingly takes the Green Lantern power inside of herself. The third thing that's going on, very highly anticipated, and I think this is a great place to start. Would love to turn it over to Justin here for this one. But the shade shows up, played by Jonathan Cake, a.k.a. good old Johnny Cakes, shows up in town. He's looking for some stuff. Uh, yeah, but he's played by a guy named Jonathan Cake, who we affectionately call Johnny Cakes. Here Johnny on the show. Cakes, and a lot of pancakes in this episode, a subtle nod to Johnny Cakes himself. <laughs> exactly. Dick there you go. And he shows up, interacts with Barbara, is very interested in some of the relics that were left by, why do I keep liking his name, the wizard? The magician. <laughs> The magician. magician. There you go. Uh, Last season, he also talks to Pat very briefly. We don't exactly get to know what he wants, but Pat does know who he is. And by the end of the episode, Courtney is very excited to fight the shade and have a new mission, new villain to fight here in Blue Valley. So let's kick it off with the shade. This is a character who has existed in DC Comics for a very long time, but really came to prominence in James Robinson's run on Starman, which, Justin, of course, you're a huge fan of. Yes. What did you think about him in the episode? How how was it? it it's I uh, I really liked. It. I think the uh, Johnny Cakes uh, I think is a, is a great shade. Um, it's interesting. They sort of very soft play the entrance of sh- of shade. Um, someone who's just wanders into town basically. Um, I in the comic. So uh, the shade was uh, a little more background. The shade was just sort of a random villain for the flash and and starman and um a couple different sort of uh, characters back back then golden age silver age characters uh and was like just a shadow guy that shot shadows and like cackled like a maniac and then in the james robinson run um he became this sort of refined gentleman uh who likes to sip sherry and is sort of beyond the um good good guy bad guy uh dichotomy and is more of like, hey, I'm just a person. I've always been a villain because I like to steal things. I like to break the rules. Um, but then he ends up becoming sort of a a mentor and uh, sort of and it helps Starman throughout his uh, journeys. And then we learn a ton more backstory in a couple of limited series, comic book series, about how the Shade um, has been hunted by this family his entire life. And that's one of the reasons why he just has no uh, moral compass, because he's constantly being um, tried to be, trying to be killed by these people. Uh, so great character. I really like here. I'm curious how uh, the Shade will play throughout the season. Um as a a hard villain or will become sort of the, the other side of uh, a mentor, Pat being the bright sort of ah shucks superhero guy and maybe the shade becoming 
sort of a down and dirty uh, superhero mentor. Well, regardless, it really ties into the themes of the season. We know we're getting Eclipso in the flesh at some point down the road, but that's darkness, very obviously fighting against Stargirl's light. Same thing here with the shade. That's bringing dark powers, which you don't really get to see in this episode. But again, it's a very clear villain hero thing that they've set up here. And this is a bit of a side thing, but I don't know that we were down on the first episode, but I feel like we had mixed reactions to the first episode of the season. I like this episode a lot better. This felt much more on par with the first season. I like Jenny's story. I like the shade. I thought the Eclipso stuff was appropriately terrifying. So good episode in my mind. What do you think, Pete? Well, I, I not enough Mikey. I mean, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like, you're going to have pancakes and not really give Mikey, like... Well, that is the scene he was in. And, uh, of course, we got... I mean, pancakes are breakfast candy. Mm-hmm. Right. So, of course, yeah. Mikey. Yeah. We all know that. I'll tell you what. The one note I wrote down about Mikey is, Mikey barely eating his pancakes. Is he okay? Yeah, exactly. Like, what's uh, going on? This is the like, first sign that he's evil. I think oh. this is an evil Mikey who doesn't even uh, touch his pancakes. Oh, wow. Oh, man. Yeah. So you think Cindy already got to him and corrupted already him? Already switched him mm-hmm. out. Did wow. Cindy corrupt him or is Mikey the secret force behind it all? Wow. The real eclipse of. Yeah. He's already uh, <laughs> suffused with the ultimate corruption, which is cavities. So <laughs> it's a short story. Yeah. Exactly. He's got cavities in his just bones. <laughs> but I do... <laughs> I do agree. I think this is a a better app. It's back to kind of what we know and love for sure. A little bit. The pacing's better. We got a lot of stuff kind of happening, which is great. Um, Yeah. And the uh, Dick Swift, uh, you know, I appreciate the fact that he's rolling to town. If you're going to go up against Pat, you better have a sweet ride. And he's got a 65 Jaguar. So, uh, you know, definitely can roll with Pat. So that's it's nice to see. Do you think they're going to have a drag race? Is that what you think was going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. They might just have a nice little Sunday where everybody brings their cars and kind of lines them up and talks about it. Well, you know, we Tillian. know Pat's a great mechanic because we've seen him touch some cars sometimes. <laughs> um, have we? Have we actually seen He's been around seen cars. He's, He's been, been next cars. to cars. He has uh, been next to cars. And I will say, though, the only time we saw him driving one, he got in an accident because it, he doesn't hey, have to drive. Hey, come on. <laughs> come on. So he, what, did you think, what did you think about the shade, Pete? Other than the fact that you like calling him Dick Swift. Um, yeah. Quit throwing I mean, shade and tell us about shade. Ah, uh, they picked up on it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's weird because I thought he would be creepier. Like there were times where I thought he would kind of like do a little bit more villainous stuff. But he seems super cash in no hurry whatsoever. Uh, slowly collecting information. Uh, yeah, and... Um, there's not much to him yet. I'm I'm interested to see what's going to kind of happen, uh, especially if we get more kind of like a uh, snar band back on the scene, like if he'll no shade or if that will kind of be a thing. Well, and it's interesting to me, like in both sides of this episode, the, the shade side, it's like, yeah, he's not super evil here. He's just sort of doing his business. And we have mm-hmm. Jenny, Jade, who is like comes into town as this like, I'm a sweet hero. And then we realize that she has some issues that that sort of change that. She's not just this, like, aw shuck superhero, like with the way Courtney and a lot of the characters have been sort of portrayed in the first season. We're getting into some gray area here, and I think that may be a lot of the theme of this season, with Eclipso being outside of that and just, like, straight-up evil. Hmm. Uh, but it was nice to see somebody recognize Stripesy and give him a little props. You know what I mean? Come on. Stripesy got some love in this episode. Yeah. Uh Wait, I wanted to talk a little further about the scene with Shade and Barbara, because that brought up maybe not an interesting question, but a question in my mind is like, what is what is I bet it's interesting. Oh, OK. Just here we go. Here oh, we go. Oh, wow. What is Barbara doing right now? Now, I wrote this exact same question down. I was like, what the fuck is America Dream doing now? It was <laughs> yeah. an evil organization <laughs> and they're all gone. Is she going to work being like, I don't know. Is she doing evil? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they were a neighborhood revitalization organization, which was bent on the ultimate destruction of, I think, it was like 50% of the people in America or something like that, or at least part of the Midwest, if I remember correctly, for the plot. They were going to create a little zone where everyone is... Bubble or something. Yeah. 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 So... 
she could still be doing the neighborhood revitalization part, but yeah, it's unclear. Yeah, that's what she's doing. But nobody works there. She's well, no, just sitting no at a, higher ups, but you know they're they're still trying to revitalize the neighborhood. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's not the most important thing. But I feel like that because you like Amy Smart. Yeah, that's right. She. I don't know. We just need. Some clar like one line, one line of clarification is all You'll I need. I don't need a plot line about it. I just need her to be like, ever since Icicle died when Mikey killed him with the truck, we've been revitalizing the neighborhood on our own and finally using this organization for good. Exactly. Yeah, they have that. It, every, they shoot that every episode, but then they cut it for time. Oh, OK. Yeah, ever but, since Icicle died, now we're a hardware store. I don't know. Maybe something. I, they were a lot of Truly anything will do. Maybe there she's just sifting through a lot of the HR complaints about everyone exactly. being evil who works. <laughs> yeah. And about that giant satellite dish that just kind of grew out of the ground for some reason. Yeah, that's definitely some questions that you need to answer. Also, the Colonel Sanders dude that worked there and didn't seem to do anything. <laughs> what was going on with him? What happened to Colonel yeah, Sanders? She's investigating any Nordic, pa- evil Nordic parents that anyone. Well, she's doing a terrible job there. because they're, <laughs> yeah. they're standing out on Main Street. They're thriving. <laughs> Yeah, they're thriving. Exactly, Pete. They're thriving out there in the Midwest. Let's move on and talk about Jenny then, because that is the bulk of the episode. What did you think about this character? What did you think about, I believe it's Issa Penarejo is the actress who plays the character. Um, And also, Justin, I don't know. You seem to be the one who knows these more esoteric DC Comics character. I don't know if you read the Infinity Ig stuff, if you like Jade. She's a character who, like... In my mind, because I mostly read the JSA stuff, was there as Alan Scott's daughter and Obsidian's sister, and that's sort of how I know her. You know? Yeah, I mean that's um, that's sort of the whole thing. Um, I I like Jade as a character. I um, I do think, and I like the way they sort of handled her and powered her up here. That, and I'm not sure if it happened in this exact same way in the DC universe, but she, the power does come from inside of her, I believe, mm-hmm. in the comic book as well. Um, the big thing for me, um, and we can talk about Jaden more in a second, but how do we feel about seeing a Green Lantern on the screen again? Pretty that, good. I was like, when the ring started floating around and when she started to do constructs, I was like, oh, yes, I like this. But it's been sort of tainted by soon. something. Yeah, too, too soon? soon? Yeah. I'm After like, Ryan I, Reynolds' movie? Exactly. That came out in 2011, well, I believe. As soon as I saw the glowing and I was like, oh, no, shitty kind of like. You know, Ryan Reynolds in that, like, made-up costume, and then it's like, all they can do is imagine cars and, like, giant punching uh, gloves and stuff. Well, I'm like, oh. you, first of all, you love cars. Second of all, also, yeah. all she can imagine is cars. Right. She's like yeah. you. Yeah. She's just like you. <laughs> um, the, Was that the, the first biggest... time you saw yourself represented on screen, Pete? Well, it's just, for some reason, with Green Lantern, they always do that. They do, like, an old-school, like... Hot Wheels track that they Green Lantern's always got to make first, and then they go like cars, and then re- they, it takes a while for them to get like creative enough to imagine their own kind of thing. Pete, that's the same thing you would do: cars, um, uh, vodka, lemonades, <laughs> <laughs> a cheesesteak, and a oh, cheesesteak yeah. would be yeah. your concert. You'd fight villains with cheese whiz, hot yeah, cheese right. whiz. That's right. So, like, what are you talking about? This is right over the plate for you. <laughs> Um, most of my exposure to Jade as a character in the DC universe was when she was um, uh, connected in a relationship with Kyle Rayner, the Green mm-hmm. Lantern, Ooh, um, yeah. from like sort of the 90s uh, and after that. So um, so I do like her from that, the, that run. To the point you were saying earlier, though, Justin, just to jump back, I thought it was great when we saw the Green Lantern in that flashback. That was awesome because... We, uh, unlike Pete, I can get over things that happened 10 years ago that were fine and not a huge part of my life. Green Lantern uh, we, is not fine. Okay, You that just movie don't was... like Green Lantern in general. Like, this has nothing to do with the movie. You don't like the comics. You don't like the character. You're not into him. Ooh, oh, Pete's clutching his pearls. Clutching his yeah. pearls. Fine. You don't like rings. You don't like giving people rings for some mm-hmm. reason. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh But from my perspective, so just a brief little bit more history, just in case anybody is curious out there. So, yes, there was the Ryan Reynolds movie, which was a disaster and such a big disaster that by reaction and Pete, you should feel good about this, though. 
by direct reaction to the disaster of that movie, we got the Arrowverse. Like, we would not have Stargirl if it wasn't for Mark Guggenheim and Jeff Johns and company being kind of bummed out by the experience of what happened with Green Lantern. They decided they wanted to do something more grounded, wanted to do something more accessible. They were inspired by Batman Begins, and they ultimately pitched Arrow. Like, that was a direct line there. And from Arrow, you have all of these other shows growing out, including eventually Stargirl and all of the other DC shows. So that is a good thing that came out of it. Also, Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively getting married, Pete, is another good thing that came out of that movie, all right? Strong so, relationship. It's yeah. a beautiful and, relationship. And Ryan Reynolds and Taika Waititi no, no, because in Free Guy, the ti- uh, no, which Tiger- brought back movie theaters this weekend. Movie theaters are back because hey, of Free Guy. Hey, listen. So that's exciting. They that even denied... Happened. They denied working together on Green Lantern. They said on the press junket that Free Guy was the first time they've ever worked together. Oh, okay. Well, they're a bunch of effing liars. All right, I don't even want to curse there. Oh, uh, first off, it. all I heard was blah blah Both blah up. blah. I'm smart guy, Alex. But Arrow started. I didn't I mean, even get into the live action stuff from the Zack Snyder Justice League, where we got very little blips in the background of Green Lantern. Multiple times, apparently, Zack Snyder tried to bring in Jon Stewart and other Green Lanterns, and Warner Brothers kept saying, nope, nope, not going to do that. So you get little blips there. So to that point, we haven't got Green Lantern on screen for over a decade, and if you ignore that movie, Feels good. this Feels is really, good. to me, the first time we've really seen a good Green Lantern story, frankly. And I, I was very, again... Very excited to see that lantern. Very excited to see the ring. And I'm excited to see what happens when she graduates from doing cars to cheesesteaks or whatever else is going on. <laughs> the next phase. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. And it's interesting to me that Green Lantern, it was like, oh, that was bad. And it, their, the response with this Green Lantern is it's more rooted in legacy, more rooted in con- the continuity of, of DC Comics and uh, not even the Arrowverse, like, we don't know any of these characters really, except for in Stargirl. So, like, it's actually a little more harder to understand if you're just approaching it. But I think they do a great job of just showing us that, and we get to see like legacy means something on this show. Well, uh, uh, I just it has oh, meaning. Ahead, yeah. I wanted to ask you guys if you were around something that was like green and you thought would maybe explode, would you bring it to the center of town where everybody could see you? Or maybe would you try to run off into the woods or something? You know what I mean? That was a note that I wrote down as well. Why go to the center of the town? Exactly. Like, granted, very fun shot with Pat in the diner and all the kids running by with the exploding <laughs> yeah, lantern. That, that was very fun and that definitely was worth it. Classic and fun, yeah. But the idea of like, oh no, we're gonna kill so many people, let's bring it to the exact center of town seems weird. Seems ludicrous. Well, there's a park there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It also, it doesn't explode that large. It's a small explosion. Yeah. Is it it's Jenny is holding lantern. in the explosion, I guess? Yeah, it goes right into her. I mean, have you ever seen a lantern? They're small. Hmm. And uh, No, I've never seen a lantern. Oh, you, you should. I bet you're confused by a lot of this. A lantern's <laughs> like, um, let's see, it's like a flashlight, but uh-huh. it's hot. It's like a hot flashlight. Oh, yeah, I have a bunch of hot flashlights at home. Yeah, I'm not so going to gonna elaborate. Know. Right. <laughs> you mean like attractive flashlights? That, oh, well, this maybe. is not going it, well. It, <laughs> and I guess we'll stop I said there I wasn't going to elaborate, but yeah. I'll, let, I'll let the <laughs> listener, their imagination, take flight here. The right. other thing, and we touched on this earlier, that I thought was really good about Jenny that elevated this episode versus the last one is Jenny was so clearly drawn in opposition to Courtney and everything ultimately, though this is a team show should revolve around Courtney in some way. And the fact that it did get under Courtney's skin, that it did draw this line between her and the rest of the JSA and Pat and everybody else. I thought was very smart and well acted as well for Breck Baxter. I thought that one, that was good. Yeah. And like, we can see Courtney and be like, ah, you're being a little bit like, be a little bit cooler about this. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, be like, yeah, but it's also, she is stepping in. She is not super trustworthy yet. Everyone else around Courtney is immediately going to to Jenny. So it does a good job of being, you don't fully agree with Courtney, but you're sort of on her side. Yeah. I I could understand where she was coming from. I was a little 
I was like, all right. I mean, you're in high school. I can I can understand what you're go- why why you're doing this. Um, but I wanted to kind of switch gears and talk about some of the comedy that they brought in this episode. Uh, that Green Llama joke instead of saying Green Lantern. I mean, that was comedy gold right there. And mm. then, but then that's an actual really- character, by the way, the Green Llama. I don't think it's a DC Comics character. It's a sort of general, I don't even know what you call it, like one of those old vigilantes. <laughs> a general character. A general rights character is what I was going to say. Yeah. It's somebody who's like old enough that has kind of fallen into the public domain. Oh, but, you, you. so you think someone specifically gave a shout out to the Green Llama? Yes. Were you thinking it was a Green Llama, like the animal? I thought it was just instead of saying Green Lantern, there was a play mm. on words. They said Llama. And no, no, no. It's like, because uh, they were like the this spirit, group- the shadow type character the green llama. Oh, okay okay i thought it was just like green lantern doesn't matter so i'm just gonna say green llama you know something like yeah you know, i thought it was a it fun... was an easter egg man it wasn't oh, funny it was serious damn it well then i take Deadly back my serious. compliment and uh i i felt like the bueller joke was fell a little flat but i did appreciate the fact that uh rick's still feeding grundy or wait, some wait, giant... you just wait. skip by the fact that the teacher yes. Is the teacher from Stranger Things, Mr. Clark, played by Randy Havens, who shows up here, who we did a show with once on a cruise yes. ship, no less. On a cruise ship. Let's yeah. not forget that. And we actually hung out with that dude for a while, if you yeah. remember correctly. Pete, did you not remember that? I did not remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Was that time on our cruise, our Comic-Con cruise ship? Does that mean nothing to you? Uh, when we shared not only a room, but a bed? <laughs> Have you forgotten everything Listen, that occurred? To, to, to clarify, I, it was I not I sharing a bed. It, it was not sharing a bed with Randy Havens, who plays Mr. Clark on street. That's true. That's yeah. true. That's true. But he was a but cool dude. I, he was very friendly and nice. I liked hanging out with he him. He was cool. And I like that he has the, the teacher cinematic universe sort of mm-hmm. unlock um, oh, across wow. a lot of yeah. television. Yeah. He's Playing definitely got here, the summer uh, beard going on. Like he's got the mustache yes. on Stranger Things. Here he's getting a little, letting it get a little loose, I guess. Maybe yeah. it was the beard that threw me. Mm. This, yeah. This I also Geisinger. like the Geisinger. summer school thing, and I want to see more of that. I like that they brought Yolanda into it. That's smart. Rick also being into it. Just like, great. Throw them all into summer school class. Have them get into shenanigans. Love yeah. it. That's a good yeah, sign. Courtney's fun. not being able to hide her joy for seeing Yolanda at summer school was really, it was sweet. Yeah. That was very good. Another one, I don't know if you're going to call this out, but at the end when Pat... When she's like, listen, I'm going to take a chill this summer. I'm going to concentrate on my studies. And then Pat brings up about the shade and starts yeah. talking about it. And she just starts yeah. bunching up and looks like <laughs> she's going to explode. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Love that moment, too. Yeah. That was nice. That was um, nice. I, um, when P mentioned Rick um, going to feed Grundy. Yeah. In, a, in the shallowest little creek. Is the implication here that Grundy lives in that little trickle of a stream? I don't know, from uh, the where, shot, it seems like he lives in the trees, like he's looking down. Grundy's whole thing is I, he comes from a swamp. So it is, the fact that they have him being fed by, like, a, a brook mm-hmm. is very strange. Uh, it's it also is, nice, though, that he switches it up. He goes, like, from chicken to pizza. I'm excited to see what's next. Oh, what do you think? Tacos, maybe? Taco Ooh, night? That would be nice. Cool. It is very funny to me how much they're keeping Grundy off screen Clearly to, like, save a little time and a little money in terms of effects, which is totally fine and totally understandable. But having Rick come in and be like, hmm, I hear a weird noise. Well, anyway, time to leave. Uh, I hope. What? Go ahead. The implication that Grundy is, like, literally off, like, right off camera waiting for his pizza delivery. And right. then as like, as well, you do. I guess he'll come and eat this eventually. Rick turns around and Grundy's there eating the pizza. Having just emerged from uh, well, like the, the equivalent of a mud puddle yes. is very funny <laughs> to me. Uh, yeah, we need to see a little bit more of that. I know they're probably also doing the Jaws thing of like holding back on Grundy and eventually they're going to reveal him. Maybe it'll be a different looking Grundy. But it's well, also if, if Grundy's eating chicken and pizza, he's going to be a, a, an overweight Grundy. Oh, he needs some vegetables. Oh, come on. Come on. He's, he's, a, he's a big vegetables. guy. He's, he's a, big, a guy. big guy. I so was, he's, he's, in he's, fact, I was, uh, I was suggesting since we're getting so many Starman things, maybe we're going to get the thinner, more hippie-ish Grundy who shows up at the Starman run, potentially. A friendly wow. Grundy. Friendly. 
an innocent Grundy. Friendly. Also, it's one of those mm. things where you can't just, you know, like feed him twice and then expect to be friends. Like, he's got to earn Grundy's trust. You know what I mean? Like, Rick is slow playing I can, this. I had to leave smart. so many meals outside of your apartment before we became friends. Yeah, that's true. It <laughs> worked, though. It definitely worked. <laughs> Look at us now. Yeah, you know what I always now. say? Feed me once, shame on me. Feed me twice, shame on you. Feed me three times, we're friends. <laughs> that, is, that is how that saying goes. Yeah. I even got the first part, I think, wrong regardless. But <laughs> last thing we should talk about, we didn't really talk about the Cindy plot line here with her mom. Starts off with a little girls just want to have fun. That's been stuck in my head since watching the episode 100%. Very fun. But uh, I like this. This is super dark, and this Eclipso stuff continues to be very disturbing. I do want to clarify that what Eclipso did was eat the mom's soul, and that's what's left over. So Cindy ate her mom. Stop with the jump into conclusions. You can't I put those together. I am not jumping to conclusions. She was very broken up about it. Her mom turned into dust. It wasn't like she You'd be sad, too, her. if you ate your mom, oh right? I'm not going to... Yeah. I'm, I'm not even... Stop, okay? She I'll eat your star- mom. Oh my god! Tempt, well, you have to tempt her. First. You first off, you eat my mom, and my dad will fucking kick the shit out of you. So good luck with no that. No way, man. I'll bring my dad's, dad with me, and my dad will kick your dad's butt. No way. There's no way. Dad's for dessert. My dad is so strong. <laughs> dad's for dessert. Um, it was Danny dessert. That's the I title th- of your erotic stop. novella, right? Oh my god! <laughs> exactly. I thought it was a nice. You said moment. erotic, right? Where, where <laughs> yeah. Cindy. Maybe. Cindy was kind of like upset that you know she had to do that to her mom. There was like a, a nice little moment there, but you'd like, be upset uh, too if you ate your mom. Stop. Of course. Well, it's his, it's, she, it's her eat, she turned her mom into dust. It was like a Thanos kind of thing. It wasn't, uh, you know, there was no eating. I, she didn't open her mouth and ingest. There was well, there she's was not no going to eat the dust. That was just all the dust inside her stepmom, and she <laughs> left the dust because who wants to eat that? And you've right. seen the deleted scenes from Avengers Infinity War where Thanos is like, I'm going to eat all of your moms, 50% of them, no. FYI. Yeah. It's not moms. Also Spider-Man. I ate Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> and then he said, I'm going to save the daddies for dessert. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thanos said that. <laughs> Josh and Brolin. then a big Thanos. link came up like to his self-puffed erotic novella. That's oh right. <laughs> that I ghost wrote. Thank you for putting that out there, Alex. Yeah, no problem. Um, the Eclipso stuff was scary, yes, uh, um, and in a good way. It's in, it, it's funny to see the little elf on the knife mm-hmm. animation um, because that is sort of the goofiest part of an otherwise very scary villain. I also, and I think this is fine. I'm not actually upset about this, but the whole thing with Eclipso at the end, where Cindy is like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm in charge. What are you doing?" And he's like, "Oh." I'm sorry. You're definitely in charge. Yeah. It was very, uh, why is Cindy being fooled by this? I mean, I assume it's magic is the reason and uh, Calypso has this influence that he puts over people, including her. But at the same time, it's like, uh, you got to figure this out. Well, and uh, Eclipso's whole thing is tempting people. And then once they do the bad thing, then he gets to eat their soul and their their mom and their moms. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. Um, Stop. So, So I I think we're going to get a lot of temptation this season um, and with the characters in varying degrees giving into it, I would think. Mm -hmm. Um, You think we're going to see a lot of tempting mommies in this season is what you're saying. Stop. That's what I'm saying. And the only, like, think about what (laughs) moms we have in this show. We have, well, Amy Smart, I guess, Mm -hmm. is really the main. Uh, What we're going to see. how tempted are you by Amy Smart as mommy? Just to <laughs> stop or being beat. Do you stop. think? Do you think Amy Smart will be tempted to do evil, All right, or is so she too good? Is she too good? Something that we teased in this episode that we're going to see a lot of moving forward is the flamethrower. Uh, now, now on uh, Stripe C. So it'll be nice to see, um, you know, the uh, the use of that going forward. A lot of bad guys getting lit up. What do you Are think you- of? Zeke. Oh, going to ask the same question. Yeah. Zeke's great. Zeke's weird. Zeke is weird. Know. It's fun to have Zeke's a Zeke like, in your auto shop. Definitely, but Zeke's like, well, put the flamethrower on. See y'all later. Like, what is it? He's <laughs> I just don't know. Like, What's this deal? Just friendly handyman? 
comes and goes as he pleases. Is he somebody else? Like, everybody on the show is always somebody else. We had the janitor was Shining Knight last season. Is he going to turn out to be... I don't even know who he would turn out to be. The original Wildcat or something like that. Or he's a time-traveling stripesy for the future. Ooh, that's fun. A looper. Mm-hmm. It's a looper situation. But you liked him, Pete, right? That was another time, another first time you saw yourself represented on screen? Yeah, exactly. I thought I thought it was a fun, just like, I'm not here to take it away from anybody else. I'm just here for the flamethrower, and now I'm out. It was nice. Yeah. Excellent. Before we wrap up, any other notes you guys wanted to bring up? Um, I just let's a quick shout out to a, a Pat, just really knowing how to handle himself in any situation. <laughs> when he said to Shade, "I just remembered something. I'm double parked," and then ran out of the store. Like, really classic. Killing just it. got away with it. Just mm-hmm. got away with another. Scott free. Scott free. Yeah. And um, I think we should start a new segment um, called the uh, La Mikey's Evil, Evil O Meter, where mm-hmm. each episode we can sort of uh, really put a number to how evil Mikey is. Oh, okay. Uh, well, why don't you start? E- scale yeah. of one to 10 or one to like chocolate cake? <laughs> yeah, I think um, where the scale isn't, yeah, it's, it's different types of candy. Mm-hmm. So um, with zero being Necco wafer, sure. oh. uh, the worst candy, like oh, eating chocolate. Oh, man. And uh, chocolate volcano being the most decadent candy, oh, and the right. most e- therefore the most evil. So how evil, speaking in candy, mm-hmm. was Mikey in this episode? Chocolate volcano. Chocolate yeah, volcano? Fully. Whoa. <laughs> don't, Go don't right for it. He didn't eat his pancakes. Who is that guy? That's an evil Mikey is who that is. Absolutely. And apparently they're the best pancakes ever. Yeah. Everybody think, agreed. Yeah, the secret ingredient is flour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were just eating awful pancakes. Yeah. These are pancakes. <laughs> These are drink coasters with syrup on them. <laughs> then in comes Jenny with flour and eggs and sugar, uh, I, milk. And I made pancakes like, this oh. morning, let me be honest. Nice. Oh, wow. Thanks for Strawberries. being honest with us. Yeah, I thanks. would put them at about a now and later, I would say, which oh, to wow. me is like right above a deck of wafer in terms of. Yeah. Terrible. Oh, come on, Just man. absolutely terrible candy. What? Disgusting. Yeah, not, not Too super hard. Evil. No flavor. Yeah, definitely. And they Awful. stick to your teeth. Oh, it's hard God. to get out. Yeah, why yeah. would you ever eat one of those? Terrible. Oh, I mean, we spent a lot of time raiding candy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's so move on from raiding candy to raiding people and talk about who was the star of the episode. Pete, who was your star of the episode? I'm going to say Jenny. I thought... Uh, I liked her character. The glowing eye was nice. Um, I, I feel like I'm excited to get to know this character more and what's going on. Justin, what about you? Um, well, I, I guess I got to give it up for Shade. Um, great to see Shade into, in this. I think um, the character is going to leave a, a good mark on the show, and I look forward to seeing how it plays out. I guess I'll throw it out to Cindy, <laughs> Cindy's mom then, I guess, in this episode. Oh. Good. Yeah. Oh. She seemed to be having fun until she wasn't. But, uh, oh, she was so close to freedom, man. She had such a hard life on this show. Oh. But now yeah. her daughter ate her. That's oh. very sad. Stop it. Daughter she ate was, her. The problem is she was too tempting of a mommy, you know? Yeah. Stop. Tempting mommy. She's gone. She's so, doing R.I.P. Cindy's Just, mom. I'm sure your character like, had a name, but. I don't know what it is. We we don't know it. Mrs. Berman. <laughs> uh, we don't. Uh, we the only thing we really know about her is, like all girls, she just wanted to have fun. Oh, oh. Wow. If you'd like to support our podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about Stargirl. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Star Guys Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, Star Guys out. Yeah.